Welcome everyone, Costini here with a discussion about the Chaos Dwarves in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. We have gotten a campaign preview for the Chaos Dwarves, though it, that is very much still work in progress based on the statement they put out at, on the video, as well as, of course, some of the things that are in the video itself. So we start with a battle between the Chaos Dwarves and the Greenskin, specifically the Darklands Orc faction, which currently controls many of their territories that the Chaos Dwarves should have in the lore in both Realms of Chaos and Immortal Empires. Now, this initial battle isn't too important, and I don't want to focus too, many on, too much on the details of the units, the stats, or anything like that, but we do have a combined roster of Greenskins, Orcs, Goblins, Hobgoblins, and of course, Chaos Dwarves. We also have the Monstrous units. So to me, their unit roster, based on what we saw in the video, seems like a combination of the regular Dwarves, combined, of course, with some Monstrous units, Beastmen inspired by the looks of it, as well as, of course, Greenskin units. So we get some version of the Orc Boys with a two-handed weapon, a two-handed version of the Orc Boys. Seems pretty potent, actually. They can recruit very early on. Uh, then you get ga uh, goblin laborers, uh, and then, of course, hobgoblins. Now, this initial battle, what it's showing, one of the things I found interesting about this initial battle was the fact, uh, was the way uh, he used, and not just in his battle, but throughout the video, uh, some of the ways he used uh, the blunderbusses, the funders of the Chaos Dwarves, the Gunpowder Units. Now, Gunpowder Units have a lot of issues currently in the in the game, and it will be interesting to see if they fix that. Based on some of the ways he was giving orders to these Gunpowder Units, it wouldn't have worked very well in the current version of the game. But we'll see how that plays out. And there were certainly points where he was firing at units, and if he was trying to make that shot in the current game, just you know, those kind of shots wouldn't have worked. We did also get to see Astrogoth, uh, the Legendary Lord, the guy in the mech suit. He seems to be very, very mobile on the battlefield, as well as capable of doing a lot of damage in melee and having magic. So he does have the melee skill tree. We do see that later in the video when we're looking at his skill tree. He does have the melee skill tree. He does have magic as well available uh, to himself. Uh, I would say probably that you're likely going to want to focus in that skill tree on the melee tree because he does seem to be very powerful. It seems to have pretty good stats uh, in melee um, and having that melee skill tree that obviously will give him a lot of melee potential. For magic, you would probably want to get a dedicated mage for that. Seems like the better choice on that. Then we moved on to the campaign situation and what caught my eye when it came to the campaign situation is we start in the same location in the same province that Boris Ursa starts in the Realms of Chaos. We're basically in control of two settlements of this province and the Darkland Orcs have uh, two settlements based on what uh, what they've shown. Now there's a lot of things to unpack here but I hate this province. I'm gonna say that out loud. I don't think this province is particularly great to have as a certain location. Boris Ursus has a lot of issues in his campaign in Realms of Chaos. For all the power he has in Immortal Empires, he has a lot of issues just because of the starting uh, position. But, as we later saw much later in the video when they showed his, uh, when we, sh we, got, uh, we got to see a skill line, uh, you do get the diplomatic benefit with Chaos and you do get the diplomatic benefit with Ogres. And that those are two of the main issues that Boris has in his campaign. So. Hopefully, it would be will be a much better position than what Boris Ursus has to deal with. Now, talking about mechanics, there's a lot to unpack here when it comes to campaign mechanics. My impression of it, though, overwhelmingly so, when it came to the campaign mechanics, was that they basically looked at Troy, a Total War Saga Troy, and they're like, oh, what can we take from this? Because a Total War Saga Troy, for all the issues it has, did have some fantastic campaign mechanics. So we have different resources. We have the slave system that the Dark Elves used to have in Warhammer 2 that they no longer have. Then we have raw materials, we have armaments, and we do have an influence system as well uh, to deal with. It's also interesting to note that you can construct settlements or buildings in settlements faster by spending resources, something you can do in a Total War Saga Troy. So 
yeah, let's copy the campaign mechanics from a Total War Saga Troy. They might have even taken the expedition system from a Total War Saga Troy, but we don't know exactly how the convoy system is. But it might be based on that, actually. Or based on that combined with the caravan system of uh, that we've had for Cafe in Warhammer 3. Uh, so you're going to have to deal with a lot of um, decisions on the campaign side of things. What kind of resource you're building? What are you focusing on? What are you focusing your settlements on? You also have a, a split in the research tree. I thought the dwarves had the pretty significant research tree. Well, it turns out that the cast dwarves can have an even more significant research tree uh, between industry, sorcery, and military that uh, you, you can get over here. So a lot of choices over here uh, to focus on some potentially really powerful stuff based on what they showed though they didn't spend too much time on the technology tree but you will need different resources to get different bits of research hopefully we can get the research benefit like the dwarves can and hopefully we don't have um and we hopefully don't have a situation where we can't actually do a campaign and get uh, all of the research or the majority of the research that we actually want we didn't get to see the heroes that the cast dwarves have available like maybe there was a hint uh, at it at one point when they were showing off some gameplay the only hero we got to see was one that had training and was a centaur hero basically um, had training had some uh, pretty good melee combat abilities regarding unit recruitment we didn't necessarily see a lot but we did see the ability to recruit uh, cast dwarf warriors cast dwarf warriors with uh, gray weapons as well as a bunch of green skin units many of these units do need updated uh, uh, portraits over there certainly the uh, green uh, the orc laborers but we do have a choice between cast dwarfs of course as you might expect but they do have unit caps so any of these good units the non green skin units are going to have unit caps and the way you increase those caps is through a system called the Hellforge. Hopefully it is not going to be a repeat of something like Tomb Kings or the Beastmen. Because the problem with those systems that the Beastmen and the Tomb Kings have is that when you're playing a campaign, you pretty much never want to increase the unit caps on lower tier stuff. You want to save it for the higher tier stuff. If uh, So as Beastmen, you never want to increase like uh, anything below Minotaurs or the huge monstrous units. If you're playing as uh, the Tomb Kings, you want to save it all for army capacity, as uh, just army capacity in general, as well as some really good hero choices. So hopefully that's not going to be a, uh, the case, because if that's the case, then it's likely we're just going to be playing around with very limited cast dwarves for much of the early game, and only much later on will we actually use uh, uh, the full cast dwarf for Oster. Now, talking about the green skin units, uh, just for a second here, you do get uh, great axe orcs, you do get goblin archers, you get, do get a version of the goblin spearmen, though weaker than the goblin spearmen, and you do get a version of the nasty skulkers, though more expensive than the nasty skulkers, to be, uh, to be clear. I think the most cost-effective units are probably going to be the orc laborers, because they're basically a two-handed version of the orc boys quite a decent amount of strength there that said the hobgoblins do seem to be pretty good in terms of their combat value because if uh, because there were certain screenshots about their stats and looking at their stats they're not quite on the level of nasty skulkers but they're pretty close the only real difference between the two of them is that the hobgoblins don't have the insane level of armor piercing that the nasty skulkers have instead they have a bonus uh, versus infantry based on the screenshots that we do have available uh, over there i do certainly hope that it's not going to be a case where you're going to be running around with a bunch of chaff units because that's the most effective army that said it's worth pointing out in terms of upkeep costs that yes the orcs are pretty cheap but Obviously, there are some of the weaker units. You're probably going to run around with some combination of units between the good units and uh, the good units, and of course the chaff that is uh, very cheap uh, to recruit. Like those orc or laborers are so incredibly cheap uh, to recruit. They're just 300 uh, gold, 75 upkeep. That is ridiculous value over there. By the way, interesting thing about the uh, unit uh, unit cards. There was this moment in the video when he uh, took a step to recruit some units 
and we saw different unit cards than the one shown before. So the ones we saw for most of the video are placeholders, but these seem to be like the more finished version of them. I guess we'll see how that ends up playing out. Now, of course, this campaign is going to be focused on the Darklands, and we didn't actually get to see really anything of the Darklands except the initial province in, in which Astrogoth starts. But the rest of the Darklands, they were being very, very careful and coy to actually not show, not even in the diplomacy screen, and certainly not in the proper campaign map itself. They did give this uh, cinematic perspective of the Darklands, but that's not telling us where the settlements are, how they're going to be. Rather, uh, we just got a very broad picture of what's going on. But there are some interesting things to be mentioned about the Darklands. See, there was this particular section uh, during the video where he take, took a look at the diplomacy screen with the other Chaos Dwarves. We can see there's three other Chaos Dwarf factions. One really caught my eye in that it's strength rank one, the servants of the Conclave. Now, it's likely that these guys are controlling the Chaos Dwarf capital uh, when, when it comes to the Chaos Dwarves. And it seems to be a similar situation like King Priam of Troy, where you have a neutral faction that's controlling the capital, and then you have all the other Legion Lords. So it's, it's very much a Troy situation. Thankfully, without the bullshit supporter system, but it seems that it's going to be something that you're going to be dealing with. These guys are probably going to be very passive in their campaign. They might even get a province with just one settlement with the uh, Chaos Dwarf capital. Now, there's something very interesting in this particular picture, by the way. You might notice it. You might have noticed already. But it's right there. Let me just move the mouse cursor over here. It's right over here. And you know what it is. You know who that is. He wasn't there in Realms of Chaos, but he now is in Realms of Chaos. Grimgor Ironhide is now going to be in Realms of Chaos. God help us all. We're going to be dealing with Grimgore. Now, he likely starts next to the servants of the Conclave, and they're going to have a massive army. They're probably going to be like that Skaven faction we currently have in Immortal Empires, which has a tier 5 settlement and a massive army to defend it. Grimgore is formidable. I don't think he is so formidable that he's going to be able to overcome that. Though, of course, if they're adding Grimgore in Realms of Chaos, that screws over Greasus. And pretty much every way. Enjoy playing a campaign as Greece is going forward, I suppose. I mean, it's not like Greece's campaign was that great to begin with. But yeah, the Ogres need a rework. They've needed it for a long time. And honestly, who cares about Realms of Chaos anyway at this point in a lot of ways. But it kind of sucks. Because I imagine it is going to be Greece's. Unless the Chaos Dwarves... Do, uh, do take an aggressive stance against Grimgore, which they likely should. They should have very negative relations with, with him. That might, if this kind of faction uh, translates over, especially in Immortal Empires, that's going to do a lot to clip the wings on Grim Grimgore's empire. Because even if this faction is passive, Grimgore's likely going to declare war on them, and he's probably going to try and assault them. He hopefully will fail. And... Even if he does, even if this faction, the servants of the conflict, conclave, don't declare war on him, that's likely the other Castor factions do declare war on Grimgore and are gonna try and slow him down. I'm not sure he can quite stop Grimgore, but we'll see how that goes. It will be interesting to see how Grimgore, how powerful Grimgore is going to be within the realms of Cast, because he's very powerful in Immortal Empires. But that doesn't necessarily translate very well into power in Realms of Chaos. A lot of factions that can be pretty decent in Immortal Empires are pretty pathetic in Realms of Chaos. So we'll see about that. The biggest offender here, by the way, is, of course, Carl Franz. Also, Manfred is another really big offender here. He's pretty pathetic in Realms of Chaos, even though, uh, he, even though the Vampire Counts can be a powerhouse when it comes to Immortal Empires. Now, of course, we do have the political system, if you will, the influence system. The way this seems to work is you have various seats in the Tower of Tsar that you can occupy for various faction-wide benefits. And when the seats are occupied, you get, uh, I, I guess all of you get benefits, research, raw materials, wall breaches, all that. At the very top of it is the choice to get the confederation with certain, um, w with the legendary, other legendary lords of the Chaos Dwarves, as well as the Dwarven Capital. 
and I'm pretty certain getting access to the Dwarven capital pretty quickly is going to be a pretty big uh, priority if you can build up enough influence uh, when it comes out. So you can occupy cities, you then have dr districts, and you need to occupy, or the districts themselves need to be occupied in order to move up uh, to the next uh, tier. So lots of systems to deal with when it comes to Chaos Dwarves. We'll see how relevant all of this actually ends up being in a proper ca campaign, but I do like that there's certainly complexity being added to the campaign systems over here as opposed to what we have in a lot of factions in Total War Warhammer 3. It also seems like the systems that they do have are not going to be as frustrating as some of the systems they did try and implement in Warhammer 3. Because keep in mind, they did try and implement a lot of systems in Warhammer 3 with the factions. They just all end up failing, pretty much. I think the only things that worked well were Nakari's Force Vassalization or the Vassalization system. Um, but everything else, well, the Blood Toast, I guess, the Scarbrand as well. But everything else was kind of week. Uh, we'll see where the cast Wars land with regards to that, but what I've seen so far is pretty good. The video ends with a quest battle. It's interesting, it's a train, it's an escort mission. Hopefully it's not annoying as hell, but you can always use the mod to auto resolve quest battles, so hey, that's not too big of a deal, uh, really. Though, I guess we'll see if we actually do end up having to fight a rogue idol during the course of that uh, quest battle, or if that was just a cinematic they put together. Quasi and here signing out, don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.